In the scripture lesson that we just read, Jesus holds his first dinner party. And some people refuse to eat at it. Now that seems awkward until you realize that some people at the dinner party were fasting for religious reasons. So Jesus uses this dinner party as an opportunity to drop some clues about who he is and what he's about. And to understand these clues, we need to think about this dinner party as if it is a wedding feast. Now, I know we all have stories about family drama around wedding receptions, stories of awkwardness and resentment. That's what's going on in this story. So I heard a story about a couple that had a big wedding with more than enough food for 200 guests. The husband's side of the family was huge and the couple expected that many from that side wouldn't be able to attend. But to be safe, they ordered more than enough food for 200 guests. And they knew that they'd have plenty of leftovers so they had arranged for the extra food to be donated to the soup kitchen that the couple supported. But the bride's mother, without consulting her daughter, took the leftovers home with her. And the bride never really knew what happened to the leftover food. She didn't ask. Until about eight months later. That's when that bride's older sister, who herself had been engaged for the past 10 years, decided to finally get married uh, for tax purposes. Now, they wanted a small courthouse wedding, but the mother begged and pleaded to host a reception. The older sister agreed to a small wedding with no more than 50 guests. The younger sister, remember the younger sister, the one who was married eight months earlier, She offered to help her mother plan the reception, but the mother insisted on handling all the planning herself. So both the younger and the older sister agreed to leave everything to their mother. The ceremony was beautiful, but there was something off about the buffet at the reception. The younger sister thought the food looked eerily familiar, like identical to what she had for her wedding eight months earlier, except a little more dried out and sad looking. And when she asked her mother about the food, the mother proudly revealed that she had saved a fortune by freezing the leftover food from the younger sister's wedding and unfreezing it for the older sister's reception. The younger sister's face looked horrified. And of course, she questioned the safety of the food. And of course, the mother got upset. And of course, an argument broke out there at the reception. Can you hear the affronted tone in that younger sister's voice? Leftovers? for your daughter's wedding, risking food poisoning to save a few dollars? Now the younger sister was upset that her mother disrespected the bride and the groom's special day by using old food to celebrate a new marriage. Sometimes combining the old and the new doesn't work out. Sometimes it wrecks the party. Those are the clues that Jesus is dropping at his dinner party. Those are the clues to understanding who Jesus is and what he's about. So let me explain. Jesus holds a dinner party and he invites his disciples and the disciples of John the Baptist, and the Pharisees. Everyone 
is fasting for religious reasons, for very good reasons. The Pharisees, they fasted, we're told, the second and the fourth day of the week. John the Baptist's disciples apparently had their own reasons uh, for fasting that day. But Jesus instructs his disciples not to fast. He instructs them to enjoy the feast. And of course, of course, somebody complained. People, always unnamed people complaining, or people complaining on behalf of unnamed people, people came and complained to Jesus, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, the wedding attendants cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, hint, hint, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, hint, hint, and then they will fast on that day. Now, can you hear the affronted tone in Jesus' voice? The long-awaited Messiah has arrived, and you want to fast? You want to grieve? We should be celebrating a new era, a new world, a new salvation. And you refuse to join in the celebrations. Why is Jesus frustrated? If you're invited to a wedding banquet and you show up and fast, maybe you don't quite get the meaning of a wedding feast. Just like if you serve leftovers, tainted food at your daughter's wedding, so you look like the hero with no regard for your daughter's reputation, maybe you don't quite get the assignment. See, in Jesus' day, fasting was a public gesture of repentance. Fasting was done not only for your own sins, your own personal faults, but for the sins of the community, the sins of the nation. So here's the implication. Showing up at a wedding feast and saying, well, I'm fasting, implies disapproval of the marriage. It's an insult to the bride and the groom. Jesus is dropping clues here about who he is and what he's about. He is like a bridegroom and God is hosting a wedding feast to celebrate. Jesus is dropping clues about this covenant that God has with Israel and now with the world. The old has gone, and behold, something new is begun. God has heard our fasting cries for forgiveness and salvation, and God has replied with this message. Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which will come to all the peoples. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So therefore, the fast is over. The weeping and the gnashing of teeth have passed. The time for celebration has arrived, and you cannot combine them, the weeping and the celebrating, or something fails. Again, more clues dropped by Jesus to his dinner guests. No one unfortunately got the clues not jesus disciples not the disciples of john the baptist who himself john the baptist he understood the clues and you know darn well he explained those clues to his disciples but still they did not get the clues not the pharisees they didn't get the clues the pharisees who studied the clues and devoted their lives to getting ready for the wedding feast promised by god but still they did not get the clues. Do you get 
the clues. If you didn't get the clues, don't worry. Jesus drops some more clues for us here. Jesus compares himself to a patch. He says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it. The new from the old and a worse tear is made. So the clue here, as we talked about in the children's time, is that Jesus is a patch. Or rather, as I said to the kids, the clue is that Jesus cannot be used as a patch. Jesus is a brand new life, not an add-on repair to an old life. But, you know, being reborn from an old life to a new life, it's scary. We prefer to put patches on our problems, on our lives, so that we don't really have to change. We patch the symptoms rather than transforming the problem. We want the old life to stay the same, just patch this broken part of my life with the least inconvenience possible, please, oh please God. Jesus cannot be used like a patch. The witty little analogy that Jesus uses at his dinner party teaches that God will resist the shrinking. Discipleship. Remember, Jesus is teaching his disciples at this dinner party. Discipleship isn't about pre-shrinking God to fit our lives like a patch. It's not about conforming God to our problems. Discipleship, following Jesus, is about conforming our lives to fit God by following Jesus Christ. So I think that Jesus' patch analogy has something to say about our amalgamation, which we're marking today. We will fail if we think of any of our pre-existing congregations as a patch. We will fail if we think that we're a patch that will fix the other congregation or the other congregation is a patch that will fix us. We can patch ourselves until the cows come home, but without conforming our congregation to Christ, the next year, we'll be searching desperately for the next patch, the next temporary fix. Patch on patch on patch. Ten years ago, Dove Soap turned an experiment into a commercial. Basically, they got some research subjects, didn't tell them what was going on, they got a university professor to tell these women that they were experimenting with a new patch. That if you wear the patch, it has some properties about it that will help you to slowly recognize that you are beautiful. And then they asked the research participants to journal each day their thoughts, the reflections on wearing the patch. And the first couple days, you have videos of, I can't tell any difference. I you know, still don't uh, really like my body or feel good about myself. But as the weeks unfolded, the, the women, the participants were proclaiming, I can tell a difference. I, I feel more comfortable in my own skin. I, I felt comfortable doing this, things I wouldn't do, wearing things I wouldn't wear otherwise. And, and as you've already guessed, when they came back, they had it revealed to them that the patch was just a placebo. It, 
it had no properties about it. It didn't have any miracle about it. And so when the women looked and saw that on the back of the packaging for the patch, the ingredients read nothing, this light bulb went on in their heads and they realized something. You can't treat love, worth, value, beauty as a patch. Again, when the women turned over that patch to see that word nothing written there, an entire house of cards or a house of patches crumbled inside them. A fabric of unholy beliefs was suddenly revealed to be a hoax. They believed that they were not beautiful and that poisoned belief was revealed to be a lie. Or to put it Jesus' way, they realized that they were fasting unnecessarily at a feast. Do you get the clues? Do we get the clues? Or will we serve up leftovers to the guests, the oppressed, the grieving, the hungry, the poor, the sick, that God has invited to the wedding feast? Will we put patches upon patches on our broken lives and the ripped fabric of this broken world? Will we think we're just buying time with this amalgamation or the next inevitable amalgamation? Just enough time to get to my funeral or my children's or my grandchildren's weddings or my great-grandchildren's baptisms or my minister's retirement? Or are we going to follow Jesus Christ and conform our lives and this congregation to God.